collaboration. And this is a research network of whatever hundreds of people. So we also want to work together on these issues, with establish research networks. Like in Global Water, there's a Global Water System project, which is then our official partner, where we exchange researchers, where we co-endorse our conferences, and try to work together to understand these issues. So this is, in a nutshell, the research framework, um, which uh, I don't go into much detail anymore, because all the science one I have talked about is in this country several times ago. What I think is very important is one question is the normative challenge of Earth system governance. And this was one challenge for a long time in our project. Because we as human species, we interact with the planetary system and we have become a driving force, a geological force in the planetary system. And there's no way back. We can't say we want to stop this because we do it. So we have to kind of govern our societies, steer our societies in a way that is, and that's the question, what? I mean, so. I like this photo very much, kind of like this, it's an egg, man. it's like in this American hotel where they always ask you, how do you like your egg today, sir? And the question for us as the researchers, but also for decision makers is, what is the direction you want to steer the planet? Because we are steering the planet in unsustainable ways, but what is the normative goal of Earth system governance? How do you want your Earth? Earth system governance, what on Earth for? You can also say. And here, I think one important concept that has emerged in the last couple of years is, for example, the idea of planetary boundaries. That was a widely cited paper, Rockström and Allen Nature, 2009. Uh, it was it's a Swedish professor. He became actually the Swede of the year and some, won some prize, whatever, because it was a very influential paper. It was written with 20, 30 other researchers, was not him myself. It's also not the last word in this debate, but important is the concept. And the concept is that the planet has a number of boundaries that are guarantee a certain stability within the parameters of the Holocene. It's kind of that guarantee the world how we know it and how our civilization has developed. A world with the Netherlands, for example. And this is kind of defined and protected by these nine boundaries. I mean, they came up with nine boundaries so far, which is the climate, um, carbon dioxide concentration, ocean acidification, biodiverse species depletion, water depletion, and a number of others. And you can read this article, Rocks in Our Nature 2009. Uh, and they try to quantify this. I mean, the idea is to quantify those boundaries. For example, for climate, they have said the safe boundary for staying within our current parameters, the safe boundary is 350 ppm parts per million carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And this is also then the problem with this approach. Not the problem with the approach, the problem with this finding of these nine boundaries, three are already violated. So we are already, as a human species, at three boundaries out of nine beyond, I mean, in the red era, this is the red, that's the red, the red part. Species depletion is across, is a beyond safe limits, and climate also. I mean, it's 350. This is something we have passed, I think, in the 1970s or 1960s already. We are approaching 400 parts per million, and there's a lot of new research that argues that this is really too much. I mean, 350 is the highest amount of carbon dioxide we had in the last 500,000 years. We never had in the last 500,000 years higher parts per million in carbon dioxide equivalent uh, than 400. 380 is the absolute maximum. So we're really doing an experiment. And it's kind of, it's, this, what we're doing is the largest experiment the human race has ever done. And as in all experiments, I mean, uh, we don't know the results. It's kind of a little bit of experiments, and we're all curious what will happen. So this is kind of, in a way, the normative framework on how this uh, can, can for Earth system governance. Well, like this, where there's all this debate of tipping point, that in this Earth system, there are certain tipping elements that are very sensitive to forcing. Uh, and they have always been sensitive to forcing in the past. And now the question is, to what extent are we as human, humans forcing some of these tipping elements? And Earth system governance is, in a way, about protecting the planet from forcing, keeping us away from these tipping points in the Earth system. And there are many more. I mean, this is one new paper that came out in 2008 in uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, where lots of tipping points have been established in the scientific community. Elements in the, in, the, in the Earth system, planetary system, I can't really see this, unfortunately, because I didn't get the right photo. Anyway, but some of them are kind of well known. The Samoa line circulation, this is, if this switches, for example, then, I mean, Netherlands will dramatically cool. And that's, I mean, global warming will lead in the country here uh, to local cooling. And then whatever dieback of Amazonian forest, permafrost, the Greenland ice shield is probably the one that is most close, I and mean, where we are, have reached the closest range to a meltdown of the Greenland ice shield, 
uh, Western Arctic ice shield is luckily probably a couple of hundred years ago uh, away. That's good for us because Western Arctic ice shield means about 10 meters sea level rise. Um, so this is kind of a little bit the, the approach that has been taken in these communities. And Earth system governance is in a way to prevent this. Um, so it is, I mean, in governance is in a way to prevent this. Um, so it is, I mean, in a working definition, Earth system governance research is about the rules, rule-making mechanisms, actor networks at all levels. It's not only about international relations, it's also about local activities with the goal to steer societies towards preventing, mitigating, and unfortunately probably also to adapting to Earth system transformation. This is the working definition, it's a very broad definition of Earth system governance, but we also want to broad, build up a broad community. And therefore, we have to start with a broad definition. It is, of course, multidisciplinary in the social sciences, so in a sense, all social sciences have to contribute to this challenge. It is multidisciplinary also in a cooperation with the natural sciences, because this is where the data comes from. And we have to really closely work together with the natural sciences. And it also benefits from global research collaboration. I think this is something that is new for the social sciences. It has been much more established in the natural sciences since the 1950s. You can't work alone anymore. In the 1950s, the natural scientists started to build up global programs where all countries put their money together under one science plan and then studied polar developments, studied ocean currents or so, because nobody alone can understand an ocean current anymore. You really have to pool the data of hundreds of hundreds of scientists. And this is what social scientists have not really done that much in the past. In the last 10, 20 years, this has also changed and we have more and more global research programs where scientists from all continents are working together under one research matrix to address certain crucial issues of our time. And I think this is uh, one of the core reasons why we have set up this Earth System Governance Project. I could talk a lot about all these elements, but time is running, so I will focus only on one element, I think also because it's important for Wageningen. Because in Wageningen is a place, I understand it in a way, this, where social scientists very much have to work together with natural scientists. In a way, I mean, I don't know how you guys are seeing this, but in a little bit, the natural science is probably slightly dominant in a way. So, uh, so this is kind of very important to understand how can we as social scientists work together with natural sciences in these activities. And this becomes also more important because this Earth System Science Partnership that I mentioned originally uh, will be abolished probably next year, and then everything we put together in one big mega program. So that means that our social science individual programs will all be merged into one big thing. The working title is Earth System Research for Global Sustainability. A couple of thousand people will work together. And that means more that we have to really understand how to work together with the natural sciences. And this is not easy. I mean, there's certain challenges I have. People like whatever this one is. John Chan, who is director of the Potsdam Institute. I worked with him a couple of years. Uh, theoretical physicist, you always said you can't make a career at my institute if you're not a theoretical physicist, and that's how it starts. Because he said these are the only guys who can think logically. Good. I mean, so much for social science in these kind of communities. He argued that Earth System Science is a science, in start and ascending, whatever, transdisciplinary systems analysis based on planetary modeling, global modeling, and simulation. And this includes, in his view, also social science, which means we have to quantify, we have to put all our data into a computer model. And if you don't manage, then it's not relevant. We are not relevant. This is kind of a challenge for us to how to relate to these kind of communities, because these guys are important. And their thinking is important, because they are dominating all these steering committees and partially also funding mechanisms. And how it works, I mean, this is what I like to show my students. They always find this interesting. It's a simplistic conceptual model of the planetary machinery. So this is kind of how the entire planet is being seen in Earth system science. You can't see that this is simplistic, no? so it's actually more complicated. There's a solar system that's driving terrestrial ecosystems, <coughs> ocean dynamics you have, marine biochemistry, you have tropospheric biochemistry. Uh, chemistry. This is kind of I mean, how the entire Earth system functions. And you might wonder there's one factor is missing. And we're talking about the Anthropocene, and we say the humans have become a geological force. Uh, they're not in the system. And this is a big issue because these are kind of the little modules they have over modeling human impacts. We have some economic modules, we have population models, but most of the stuff that, for example, are studied in the EMP, you can't really put into such a computer model, I guess. And this is a challenge for us. How can we deal with these, these kind of communities, these kind of issues? So my take is, I mean, in my paper of 2007, I claimed that we need a two-pillar model 
was heavily criticized by the natural scientists. They said it's kind of a declaration of independence for the social science. They're very upset with me. And I've told this down a lot in the science plan because we were all friends and we work together. <laughs> but uh, so my idea is that when we have to accept there is an integrated versus knowledge system, this is very important. Where all these models are being brought together. Uh, and they all link up their computers and really kind of try to understand how the Earth system functions. But we also have to preserve an independent social science program, which is based on qualitative reasoning, which is based on case studies, which is based on information that is not quantified. Maybe sometimes we can quantify, some of us do, but it's not, I mean, I'm not sitting there and thinking every morning, how can I quantify what I do today? So I think that's important that we preserve this degree of independence, but also work together and experiment. And we have, for example, done one project with PVL, the Plan de Rofa Le Fontaine in the Netherlands, where we work together with them to put governments and institutions in a computer model. It's a very crazy project. The results are quite simple, I would say, in the way how we've done it. But it is, it's a lot of fun in a way, where we try to quantify governments and institutions, regime design, uh, likelihood of regime implementation on a scale of 1 to 10. And this is always fuzzy logic, because no logic doesn't help you. This fuzzy logic brings in a computer model. Uh, and this we try and we know, I mean, useful results will take another 30 years at least. But I think it's important also to start thinking about these kind of mechanisms. Well, then I have one slide that's kind of, uh, we have in the science plan, not a frequently asked question, a frequently asked misconception. I mean, what is Earth system governance not? It's not world government. There's also some Americans always here. It's not about governing the Earth system. I mean, this is certainly not possible. It is about governing social systems in a way that you prevent drastic earth system disruption, tipping points, etc., as I mentioned before. It's also not necessarily technocratic, top-down, centralized, as some people fear. It can be, I mean, there's no normative assumption, maybe a technocratic, top-down, and centralized system, as, uh, as what some physicists believe, I doubt this, but it's not part of the definition, it's not part of the program. And it's also not necessarily systems research. Um, so it is, in a way, um, a research program that is on one hand empirical analytical, it's just understanding governance processes in this domain, trying to understand their effectiveness, trying to understand the performance of governance at all scales. Uh, and then, of course, with the idea of improving it. But it's, uh, on the other hand, I think that's very important. It is also a normative research program, meaning that we have to explore reform options to really kind of dramatically probably improve our current institutional setup. Uh, to really cope with these issues. Because as I mentioned, I mean, climate is already an area where we have overshot the planetary boundary. So I think it's very important also to rethink ahead, kind of institutional backcasting, what kinds of institutions do we need in 2050 if we really, really want to resolve these issues. Uh, and this is kind of methodologically very difficult, but this is kind of, I mean, the first is kind of what, I, what I'm paid for, and this is kind of my, my hobby in a way. So I really like to, to think ahead and think about how can we really we form dramatically uh, these kind of systems that we inherited from the 19th century, essentially. Um, what I do now in this talk, I mean, as time is running, just a few slides on, on, on certain research projects we have done, a little bit on the empirical side, and the political side, but a little bit also in, in, in terms of reform of the system. To keep them uh, in, the, in the planetary body, the safe operating space. So starting, I mean, I run through the, the, all the five A's. Actually, I run through only four A's. Smaller. But agency. This is the research program as a part of the Earth System Governance Research Program that looks at the core agents that are active in Earth System Governance, which is traditionally, of course, the state. But in the last 10, 20, 40 years, many other actors became more important. Civil society organizations, bureaucracies, submission, public authorities like cities, uh, also partnerships that brought them all together, corporations. And in the Earth System Governance Network, essentially we have people and working groups that work on all of them in some way. So this is kind of all part of the research agenda to understand to what extent are these actors relevant in Earth System Governance to steer processes away from the planetary boundaries. And my own research has been recently, especially on these two, and I have a few slides on them to look at them. First, public-private partnerships. This was a claim in 2002 at the Johannesburg Summit that partnerships are the solution. There was so-called type two agreement in the Johannesburg uh, uh, Summit at that point where people argued what we really need is not these international agreements that are intergovernmental agreements, they are failing. 
they're not really protecting the planet sufficiently, they're slow in implementation. So therefore what we need is public private partnerships, multi-stakeholder networks that bring them all together and fix our problems. That are fixing the regulatory deficit, meaning there are some areas in Earth system governance where there is no regulation. Here, partnerships can resolve them. The implementation deficit that there, where there is regulation is not being implemented, partnerships can help. Or participation deficit, when there is regulation which is implemented, it's insufficient in terms of participation of marginalized actors. So this was kind of the big positive story of Johannesburg. Uh, there was also a lot of criticism at that time saying this is kind of very problematic, it's privatization, it benefits industry, it lacks accountability, and very good for industry but not good for the environment. So we developed a research program at that time where we tried to look at these issues and to put it, I mean, I have only one slide, and if you have a book for us coming, but if you have one slide, we are very critical. I mean, we became, after looking at all these issues, we built up a database in which we analyzed 330 partnerships for the Johannesburg process. Uh, and, and in the end, I mean, there are of course some partnerships which are quite good and uh, effective, but more.